Hello, and welcome to HIV.gov's continuing coverage of the AIDS 2020 virtual conference. I'm Hilary Hoffman from the National Institutes of Health, and I'm pleased to be joining you remotely today to discuss some advances in HIV treatment research. Joining me for this conversation is my colleague, Dr. Carl Diefenbach, Director of the Division of AIDS at NIH's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Carl, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure to join you today, remotely again. <laughs> Great. So, Carl, yesterday at the press conference and then today in a more formal presentation, we heard an update on findings from an NIH-funded study that's looking at birth outcomes in Botswana. Now, two years ago at the International AIDS Conference, preliminary findings from that study suggested a greater risk of neural tube defects in infants born to women who were taking the HIV drug dolutegravir at the time of conception. So could you remind us what are neural tube defects and why were these initial findings so concerning? So let's start with what a neural tube, neural tube defect is. Uh, during embryonic development, there's a process where something called the neural tube forms and it makes up all eventually all the nerve tissue, including the brain and the spinal cord. And it, what happens is that if the tube doesn't form properly, it leads to um, tremendous problems either in the brain or other parts of the central nervous system. It's an absolutely critical step in human development. Very early on in the, what we call embryogenesis or the growth of, from the egg to a full, full grown um, baby at the time of birth. Uh, this is also the, a period where that's sensitive to heat and one of the things that we know, it's very sensitive to the lack of the vitamin folate. Uh, so uh, that's the background on what a neurotube defect is. So what they, what in Botswana, um, Rebecca Zatch and her colleagues had started the Sapamo study for the purpose of looking to see if any of the drugs that we were using, antivirals, had an impact on, on neurotube formation and possibly a defect. And they wait, they actually added analysis of dolutegravir at the last moment because there was a concern, uh, the focus was on efavirenz at the time. And so they thought they were adding a very good control medication. So fast forward from 2014 when the study started to 2017, and as you said, in Amsterdam, Rebecca and her team presented this data that um, DTG uh, was associated with a statistically significant increase in neurotube defects um, in a birth cohort in Botswana. Mm -hmm. And so what effect did this finding have on HIV treatment guidelines? Well, it really made people pause and think about what we wanted to do. Um, women, rightly so, felt it was their decision to make as to whether they wanted to be on the best medication um, and then decide for themselves how to manage this. And there was a, you know, it, was, it really activated the community to have a, a, a discussion about what this all means. It was also important to realize that only about half of the data that was needed to complete the study had been collected at that time. So there was a lot of back and forth. There were places that moved quickly to try to switch and others took a slower pace. Um, you know, and it, it really was quite an upheaval you know, mm. in the treatment space for a period of time. Right. So then last year, the researchers reported some more results, and today there was a further update from the study. Um, could you summarize those for us? Sure. So what, we pre what was presented at this meeting was a, a, an, another year's worth of follow-up, uh, where the, the numbers of women that have been followed is now pretty astronomical. Uh, and the, the news is from the report today was that as time has gone on, that we've had a fairly steady level of neurotube defects 
in women who become pregnant who are living with HIV um, uh, on medications of about 0.1 is the number. What we've seen with the dolutegravir is the number has consistently continued to drop to a point, to a, a data point presented at this meeting, which was about 0.19. And that di the difference between the 0.1 and the 0.19 is not stati statistically different. So what we've seen is a mitigation of the effect. Uh, and I think that's an important point for people to take home is that uh, you know, this kind of thing happens in research and we still are, are seeking an explanation of whether there's folate deficiency or other uh, mitigating factors that made this a problem uh, or a concern over the past um, several years. Great. So these new findings or updated findings rather seem pretty encouraging. Um, what would, what would you say they mean for women living with HIV and their medication choices? I, I think a woman living with HIV um, can go now fully informed that there is a, a risk, but it's the same risk on being any medication. And I, it's more important to be, vir to be virally suppressed because that really makes it so you cannot transmit um, your HIV to your baby. Um, and so you get on medication, you stay on medication, um, you're doing the right thing for you and your family. Um, and that is a very positive and uplifting message. Yeah, absolutely. So can women feel safer now about taking dolutegravir, even if they are trying to conceive? I think so. I think that um, there's risk in every, in life. Um, and there's a, and Getting pregnant, staying pregnant, um, having a healthy baby is is the goal. Is as people working in health, that is our that's what we are seeking to do for people. Uh, and should they wish to become pregnant and stay pregnant, so I think the advice is um, continuing to be good news for women. Right, that's great, um, and. Would you say that these results kind of underscore the importance of enrolling diverse populations in clinical trials, evaluating new drugs, such as well, pregnant women? So I, you know, this is one of those interesting things is that women are, a pregnancy is viewed as a protected group. And so we often don't get to do or, or look at this kind of a question until after the drug has been approved. So to my mind, it makes the arguments that as soon as it is safe to do so, we ought to be initiating these kinds of safety studies in, that I guess would be considered more phase four to really evaluate the safety um, of these medications in pregnant women, in breastfeeding women, and also continuing to work to get these drugs licensed for um, infants and children at the youngest age as possible, because those are the those are the populations that are neglected uh, by and large once a drug is is first licensed for use in eighteen to fifty five year olds, which is the usual um, age group um, seen for um, medication studies. Right. And I think you mentioned in our interview yesterday that dolutegravir was recently approved for younger age groups as well. I did. Uh, that remains, uh, you know, so the news gets a little better on dolutegravir. And so um, glad to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to viewers who might just be joining us now, I'm Hilary Hoffman from the National Institute of Health. And I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Carl Diefenbach, discussing some advances in HIV treatment research coming out of the AIDS 2020 virtual conference this week. Um, so Carl, um, we also heard about another study um, done in Africa. This one was in South Africa and it was a clinical trial called ADVANCE. Could you give us a little bit of background on this study and what questions it sought to answer? So the, the genesis of the ADVANCE study uh, was based on a WHO recommendation that, that countries move to a dolutegravir-based regimen. 
and try um, to replace uh, efavirenz as the backbone uh, non uh, non uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitor in the regimen. So what that means is what they needed to do in the advanced study is then compare um, efavirenz-based regimen to two different dolutegravir-based regimens. One was anchored by, uh, by TAF or uh, tenofovir alafetamide. The other was uh, anchored by uh, by TDF. So we had a three-arm study looking at the safety and efficacy and ability to maintain viral suppression in these three arms with the goal toward getting data to show that the, the, the dolutegravir-based arms were not inferior to efavirenz, meaning that they were as good um, at the things they needed to do, viral suppression, safety, all of the signals that are important to people living with HIV. Um, so uh, Professor Sakela spoke today and talked about the findings of the study. And one of the things that she talked about was how fast the dolutegravir arms seem to acquire full virus suppression. Um, compared to the efavirenz arm. Uh, at the end of the study, after 96 weeks, the three arms were um, essentially determined to be, the, the, the two dolutegravir arms were non-inferior to the efavirenz-based arm. So the study accomplished its uh, primary goal. Great. And what about some of the side effects of these drugs? Did anything stand out to you in those results? So that's the interesting thing about this, um, is that last year at the conference, there was a lot of initial data coming out around the weight gain associated with dolutegravir, and maybe also it being uh, exacerbated or boosted by the use of the of TAF, the mm -hmm. uh, tenofovir alafetamide. And it was interesting, over a 96-week period, um, women on the dolutegravir plus TAF arm gained an average of, of over eight kilograms. Yeah. So that's eight kilograms in 96 weeks. Men, so, that's a lot of weight. It's uh, almost men, 20 pounds, yeah. Yeah. Men yeah. in a similar, in the same arm, gained fi almost five and a half kilograms. The, 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 the group that had the, um, the, the TDF plus DTG, the dolutegravir, the women gained a little under five kilograms on average. And then the men uh, were further reduced to about 3.6. Interestingly enough, the efavirenz-based arm, which was efavirenz plus TDF um, plus um, FTC or, um, or lamivudine, 3TC, um, the women th there gained uh, a little over three kilograms. And so there is and there should be some weight gain associated to, with return to health. So that's not unusual. What's unusual is the impressive weight gain of, of eight kilograms. So... Um, it is a little concerning, um, but I think that um, it, it can be watched. And I want to just make, let's talk a little bit about the weight gain. It is not mm -hmm. just a matter of vanity. I mean, weight gain is associated, um, particularly if it's metabolically triggered like that, with other co comorbidities, such as type 2 diabetes, such as increased risk of cardiovascular disease, like such as uh, uh, hypertension. So, this isn't trivial, uh, but it just gets to the point uh, that all medications have side effects. And, you know, the, the best um, prevention here would be never to acquire HIV. And then this is another reason we're working toward a cure. Uh, so uh, it, it's an interesting problem to have. We have these really potent, wonderful drugs, but they do have unfortunate side effects. Right. So one follow-up question, Carl. Um, 
Was, were these findings something of an anomaly or have other studies also shown evidence of weight gain? Well, that's a really important point because um, Julie Ake from the U.S. Military HIV Research Program analyzed a series of PEPFAR clinics as they were engaged in the rollout of dolutegravir through their clinics um, in something called the African Cohort Study. Uh, she reported um, there was increased weight gain over and above the weight gain you would expect with return to normal health. So I would say it's consistent. Um, so it's, it's been seen in cohort studies. It's been reproduced in clinical trials. Um, it, it, we need to figure out um, how to mitigate this and manage it in a way that is efficient and effective and helpful for patients. Absolutely. So based on the current knowledge, what advice might you give to someone living with HIV who wants to take the best antiretroviral drugs, but is also concerned with maintaining a healthy weight? Well, I think one of the interesting things is to, there's, there's been some small studies about exercise um, and making sure that you live a healthy um, uh, lifestyle, and that makes a difference in the weight gain. But again, dolutegravir is, a, is the best, most potent antiretroviral we have. The, the whole class of, uh, of integrase strand transfer inhibitors um, are, are incredibly potent. So we want people to use those medications. And so we, we want them to be able to work with their physicians so that they can mitigate any of the side effects. But you know, this is where you have a doctor um, and you and your doctor should decide what regimen is best for you. Don't take advice from me. Absolutely, yeah. It can be a matter of personal choice. As it should be. Absolutely. Well, Carl, thank you for joining me again today and sharing this information. Um, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in again. Um, We'll be back one more time tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. Eastern time with final updates from AIDS 2020 virtual. And for more information, please visit HIV.gov.